Hello friends! It is Monday, March, I'm gonna say 7th, but it could be give or take a couple days. We had a beautiful weekend up north. We did some snowy cabiny activities. It was beautiful. And now I'm just trying to get my life together, do all of the laundry and things like that. Um, so that I can be a human being. But I thought I would vlog this week. Let's see how this goes. I read some books while we were away. I bought some books while we were away at a cute little used bookstore in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, so stick around. Um, and now I need to water my plants so that they stay alive. Did the things that had to be done. Dog is drinking water. Hello. I'm back. Um, I did all of the things that had to be done today. I worked the job, did the adult thing, and now I'm back. I'm making dinner. Uh, you're in my kitchen, the lighting is terrible. And this seems like a really good time to talk about what I'm currently reading, which is Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Um, you may have heard about this book, feel like it's all over the place. It's all over the bookstagram world. But this is my first Melissa Broder. In 2018, she had a book that was really big called The Pisces, uh, which looked interesting to me but then I read that there was like a merman situation like a love affair with a mermaid man and that's a hard pass for me that's not my deal but I gave Mouse Brother a try with this one this book is about a neurotic Jewish woman and that is my deal um so, so yeah, so this story, this book follows Rachel. She lives in LA, she's in her 20s, um, and she is dealing with disordered eating. Uh, she is anorexic, she's dealing with obsessive cal caloric restriction. Um, and I'm about halfway through and she has recently become equally as obsessed with a woman who she has met who uh, works at a frozen yogurt place. She is, this other woman, Miriam, is living in a larger body and is also a practicing Orthodox Jew. Um, this is a meh for me so far, a hard meh, real meh. Um, you know, First of all, I think that Rachel's obsession with her body and weight is the sound of garlic being, is this distracting? Um, really flattens her. She is a one dimensional character to me. I am, I find it repetitive. And you know, I, I read, many books about women with um, neuroses and mental health issues. And I find that they're interesting because the obsession with their climate anxiety and career angst and existential crisis and family issues are all make up this complex identity. And, um, and in this book, Rachel's obsession with food seems to be her and that's it and that's all there is to her. Um, perhaps that shall change as I continue the book. I would also say it is just hard to read. I don't know what it is about like seeing my other neuroses and anxieties on paper feels good. You know, like seeing my 
capitalist anger in writing or seeing my climate anxieties in writing feels somehow cathartic, but seeing um, my food anxieties, and I'm not saying that I in any way suffer from disordered eating to the extent that this character does, although I think that to be a woman in modern American society is to have at least some of this probably, likely. But to have it reflected back to me in this character um, is very difficult to read. And why is that different? I don't know, I think probably because I carry some shame around those anxieties and like having anxieties about the climate makes me feel informed and aware and having anxieties about food makes me feel shameful. So there we are. Um, I also have thoughts about, I have to check on my rice. Um, I also think that I'm very confused about, or I'm very disturbed by the lack of dealing with the issue of the Israeli-Palestine politics that are at play in this book. Uh, Hannah from Let's Talk About Books Baby had a great discussion in a blog recently about the inherent privilege in only giving positive reviews and how if you can overlook a problematic piece in a piece of literature, that is your privilege, right? Um, and I sort of feel like it is like, feels very much in my face, the issue of um, Palestinian relations in this book and perhaps that will be resolved in the second half. I am looking for that. Um, but until then, I find it to be sort of heartless. I mean, it's not the only way this book is problematic. We'll see. I will have more thoughts when I complete it. The other thing I'm hoping to have resolved in the second half is right now, Rachel, our protagonist's perspective of Miriam, this woman she meets, is that she is fat and jolly, right? She has zero problems and never worries about food. And because she is larger and doesn't restrict her calories, she's carefree. Um, and that's a really naive, dehumanizing way to see this character. Um, and so I hope that she comes around to seeing her as a full and complete human and makes that evolution. Um, so we'll see. So that's where I am on those two, that book. Um, and now I'm going to finish making some rice bowls for dinner. Good morning. It is Tuesday. Um, I finished milk fed. I, I stick by my meh. It was very meh. So I mentioned last night when I was about halfway through that there were two things I was looking to resolve. One was sort of like this question of Israel-Palestine politics. Um, and the other was like this dehumanization of um, the love interest, Miriam. And I found both to be ultimately unsatisfying. Um, there is a climatic scene in which the politics of Israel is discussed. And it sort of stunk to me. It sort of stunk of like, 
good people on all sides kind of vibe. Um, I think it attempted to say that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, but it ultimately failed. Um, so that was disappointing. I also, the most upsetting thing about the book, oh, we're talking about milk fat. The most upsetting thing about the book for me was this BS around, sorry, around um, Rachel, the main character, having like lifelong ingrained fat phobia eating disorder and suddenly being cured uh, in a matter of days. And like, ouch, I don't know. So, um, also like, this book followed traditional plot structure of like, rising action, climax, resolution, which even like the classic last chapter is a um, flash forward to three years, like pretty cheesy. So this was a meh for me. Um, I also promised that I would tell you about some other books I read over the weekend. I did read Swimming Home, which I showed arriving in the mail in my first vlog, and I freaking loved it. Favorite book of the year so far, really great. This book is about a group of people who take a trip to a villa um, in France and there is a woman floating in the pool when they arrive and she sort of infiltrates their family vacation. Um, for me, the most interesting part about this book is that the central conflict is between a man and wife and he is a poet and she is a journalist. And there's this tension between our words for portraying the facts of the pain of the world or are they for making art out of them? And if you choose art, does it ultimately drive you crazy? I have a lot more to say about this. I wanna talk about this some more. I haven't decided yet, should I do should I wait and do like a March wrap up video and talk about this more? Should I do some standalone reviews? I'm not sure, but I have more to say about this. This is wonderful. I also read The Life of the Mind by Christine Smallwood. I mentioned also in my last vlog that Gia Tolentino wrote a, um, a review in The New Yorker that I could not resist. Uh, this is about a woman named Dorothy, who is an adjunct professor. The book opens with her having a miscarriage. This book is obsessed with time and endings and what does motherhood mean and uh, what does it mean to be productive and moving forward and... Um, the writing is beautiful and I have also more to say about this. So maybe I'll do a separate wrap up again. Maybe I'll include it in March. Maybe I'll do like a swimming home life of the mind video. I haven't decided yet. Tell me what, what do the people want? What do all four of you watching this want? Let me know in the comments. And then lastly, I did stop at a sweet little used bookstore and I got some goodies. Um, so first of all, I got Frontemaglia by Elena Ferrante. I mentioned in my newbie tag that I, I stan Miss Ferrante. This is not a novel um, and I have only read her fiction uh, to date. I guess I'd read a few of her columns in The Guardian, but this is a writer's journey. Um, my understanding is that this is sort of memoir, sort of meditation on writing. It's hard to call it a memoir because Ferrante is, of course, a pseudonym. Um, and so, I don't really know, but I'm excited. I've been thinking a lot, ever since I read the Patricia Lockwood 
uh, no one is talking about this. I've been thinking a lot about the fragmentary novel, which I'm a fan of. I, I enjoy an experimental form, um, but also like, I think I've been thinking about it because Jenny Offal's fragmentary novels and Patricia Lockwood's really to me are um, two totally different beasts. I don't think they're, I'm shocked by how dissimilar they are. And I recognize the temptation to group them together, but I resist that temptation. And I want to think a little bit more about this. And I know that I'm pretty sure that this means fragmentary in Italian. And I know that Ferrante has talked about like having a fragmentary mind. And so I'm, I'm interested to read this in context of my thoughts about that. Um, I also picked up Blueberries. What kind of body makes a memoir by Elena Savage? I am so excited about this. This is a collection of essays, also a experimental form. It says, blueberries could be described as a collection of essays, the closest term available for a book that resists classification. A blend of personal essay, polemic, prose poetry, true crime journalism, and confession that considers a fragmented life. Reflecting on what it means to be a woman, a body, an artist, it is both a memoir and an interrogation of a memoir. It is a new horizon in storytelling. So that sounds freaking great. I like the cover. I'm excited about this one. And then lastly, I did pick up So Much Longing and So Little Space, which is Knausgaard's book on the painter Edvard Munch. Uh, I, I bought this one for Justin. Um, he's a, he's a Knausgaard guy, men, you know what I'm saying? So I probably won't read this, but maybe we'll see. All right. It is time to start the day. Get to it. Uh, you are in my living room right now. And most of my books live here, but I am quickly running out of space. Let me do a little... All right, so most of my books, most of my fiction, most of our fiction lives here. It is categorized by alphabet by last name. So all of the W's and U's and V's are down here because we've run out of space. I do keep some of my favorites over here in this part of the living room. So, you know, I've got my Marilyn Robinson stack, my Ferrante stack, my Nell Zink, uh, Ali Smith, but uh, Otessa Moshveg, of course. Um, but we are definitely out of room here. So I bought a little shelf to go in that corner. Um, and it arrived yesterday, so I need to put that together. And you can tell me what you think and if you like it. And so maybe it'll look cluttered, but maybe it'll look okay. So that'll happen at some point today. Hello, uh, it is a beautiful sunny day. Feels like sweet, sweet spring nectar out there. And I just got an email from the library that a bunch of books I had on hold are ready and waiting for me to take them home. So Hush Puppy and I are gonna head out and walk down <clears throat> to the library. Uh, and then I'll come back and show you what I got. My TBR pile at this moment floweth over. So might be time to take a break on acquisition, if you hear me. All right. Hush Puppy and I will be back. All right, we are back from the library. We got five books here, a couple new releases, a few backlist. 
Um, okay, so first we have Shuggy Bane. I'm shocked that they had this in. Um, somebody must have just returned it. It won the 2020 Booker Prize. Unforgettable story of Hugh Shuggy Bane, a sweet and lonely boy who spends his 1980s childhood in rundown public housing in Glasgow, Scotland. That sounds great. I've heard only good things about this, got tons of press. I think this was on a lot of best books of 2020 lists. Um, psyched about this. This is also super new. Um, I think this is a 2021 release, which is crazy. My library never has stuff like that. Um, so I think I could be the first person who's ever read this library would feel that's fine. Um, Infinite Country by Patricia Engel blurbed by Lauren Groff on the cover. Love to see it. Powerful and poignant, Infinite Country crystallizes the questions we are asking today about migration, family, and our vision of the future. Talia is being held at a correctional facility for adolescent girls in the forested mountains of Colombia after committing an impulsive act of violence that may or may not have been warranted. She urgently needs to get out and get back home to Bogota. It sounds really good. I'm excited about that one. I've heard also great things about this. Um, and then I have a couple backlists here. A backlist Allie Smith I've never read. Um, this might be her first book. Nope, it's definitely not. All right. It's called There But For The. Um, came out 10 years ago, 2011. I have read The Seasonals. And I have read How to Be Both. Um, and that's it. So we'll see about this. Um, Clarice Lysfector. I hear often about Clarice Lysfector. I have heard multiple times from people that I would like her work. Uh, she is Brazilian. Brazil's greatest modern writer. Uh, the one I always hear about is The Chandelier. But my library did not have it. This is what my library had. Um, I like that it's a thin little guy, not intimidating. Translated from the Portuguese. Um, she it was very prolific. Uh, she has many, many works published and translated in English. So we'll see. Um, if I like this, I will dive into some more Life Spectre. And then lastly, this book, Supper Club. Uh, you know, sometimes you just click things when you're on the library website. I, you know, you're, it's a library, so the risk is low. I'm not exactly sure what brought me to this or who recommended this or where I read about this, but looking at the blurbs now and knowing what I just read, which was Milkfed, I'm definitely going to take a pause before I read Supper Club. Um... Roberta spends much of her time trying not to take up space. At almost 30, she's adrift and alienated from life, stuck in a mindless job and reluctant to pursue her passion for food. She suppresses her appetite and recedes to the corners of rooms. I'm not quite ready for another book on fat phobia and eating disorders quite yet. I will probably read this, but it is definitely not next. All right, we did it. New shelf, what do we think? Let's take in the room. Thoughts? You know, I just threw some stuff up there just to see. What do we think? Too much? Not enough? What do you think, Hush Puppy? Thoughts? You like it? All right. Good morning, beautiful internet friends. It is Wednesday. I'm headed out the door in a minute, but I wanted to pop in and give you an update on my reading. So last night I started Blueberries. Um, I read maybe the first three or four essays. Is Elena Savage the smartest living woman? It's possible. It is definitely possible. It is so good. Um, 
each essay so far has been in a different form, which is impressive. Uh, definite trigger warnings for rape, sexual assault. The first essay tells the story of her returning to Lisbon 11 years after having traveled there as a teenager and being the victim of a sexual assault and trying to get the police records from the police in Lisbon. And there's an interesting form about the conversation between her past self and her present self and her internal self and external self. And then the next essay is the one for which the collection is named, Blueberries. Um, and I'm not the only one probably who thought so far it was definitely the strongest. It's amazing. It is about uh, class and race and gender and all of the all of the things, the madness of academia and the hypocrisy of making art and um, the difficulty of living in a human body in a capitalist society. And it's written in these long, long, sort of breathless sentences that just expertly um, evoke the madness that as if Savage just had to get this all out in one breath. She was just so frustrated. And that's fantastic. And then the next one is written almost as descriptions along a museum. And it's called the Museum of Rape. This one actually gave me really Valeria Luiselli vibes. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. But she wrote The Story of My Teeth and another great book that I don't remember the name of right now that I loved. But I'll just put it right here and that'll do. Um, so if you like Luiselli, you might like Savage. Um, I'm really excited to keep reading this. Uh, what else is going on? Um, I'm headed downtown right now to go do a shift at the vaccine clinic. Uh, maybe I'll put also like a really flattering selfie of me in my vaccination outfit here. This is now a fashion vlog. Um, and then I'm gonna come back and finish my day. It is another beautiful, sunny day. I don't know what we did to deserve it. Um, and that's it. That's all my updates. So I think I'm going to close the vlog out here. Thank you for watching. Um, I, how do you guys think this one? I think this was better. Um, okay, great. See you soon. Just two dudes hanging out. Just two dudes hanging out.